what an inspiring story. And I really appreciate you sharing your journey with us. And I think we're going to take some time for questions. We have some mics in the room. And don't be shy. <laughs> Got to be able to see the mic. We're the mic runners. OK. OK. Can you talk a little bit about what you see the prospects of moving forward on this without the Department of Education support and how, how you see people making strategic decisions about how to do that on their campuses and in their movements? That's a great question. So I've highlighted a lot with the history. The Obama administration really put the firepower of the federal government behind the voices of survivors through the Department of Education. Also, the Department of Justice has been involved. And even within the last week, we've seen that really kind of be removed by the current administration. So I'm, I'm going to give you a slightly biased answer. Uh, invest in legal organizations, you know? <laughs> Not just the ACLU that's holding the line. I mean, Serve Justice is saying, well, OK, if we can't do it you know, through pro se filing by survivors without time, energy, resource constraints, let's start raising funds to have a litigation fund. Let's do injunctive actions. Let's get more aggressive, more assertive. And not just use Title IX, there's also this other law, the Violence Against Women Act, that amended the Clery Act. And so we have more avenues than we think. And while civil rights is a great avenue to advance in a conservative environment, the Clery Act looks at it as campus crime and security and safety, which conservatives can get on board with. So we have two different tools, and we're going to start to lean into legal actions. And on the campus level, the challenge, of course, is going to remain. My theory is that if Trump backlashes and removes protections for campus sexual assault, I think schools will actually want to put them in place. It will be their way to resist and keep the line and be progressive in an environment that is regressive. Very good. Thank you. Over here on the back side. Good morning, and thank you so much for your advocacy. Celinda Lake uh, spoke to us earlier in the conference about framing the issue. And I believe it's time to reframe the issue I believe that treating sexual violence of our young women as an administrative proceeding is completely inappropriate. And 45 years ago, when marital rape was not even a crime, I could see the purpose of trying to allow some kind of administrative relief. Mm -hmm. But I think this is, this is training wheels for sexual predators. And it should be taken out of the administrative proceeding system and into the criminal justice system. If I am raped by my husband, I don't get an administrative law judge to determine that. I get a prosecutor. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so these are great questions. Um, the criminal justice system is effective exactly 6% of the time. Six. And that's, of course, out of those who chose to report. And we know that people don't want to report to the police more, most often. There's actually in decreased reporting on campuses. So while 32% of the general population reports to police, only 20% on campus. There's just an additional layer of silence. And so the way that we kind of look at it is that campus criminal and civil work together. We almost always forget about the civil system. And trust me, there's nothing more powerful than taking a school that has hidden sexual violence to court and making them pay through the nose, because they remember that lesson for a long time. And even with perpetrators, some of these individuals are very entitled or very wealthy, the ones that somehow managed to turn up in our leadership later in the future. And they need to be stopped. I mean, this idea that we have to rely on the government and the government alone is absurd. The government isn't helping women, and they need to be. I do think we need targeted criminal justice reform, because too often we hear advocates discourage survivors from reporting to the police, and I think that's wrong, too. We need the system to be pushed, and we need it to be better. So I encourage everyone I meet, become a lawyer, become a police officer, become a judge. If you care about this issue, change the system because it is too powerful the way it is. But campuses have a unique ability to actually address this. They're not determining if a crime occurred. They're at the misconduct level. Just like there's plagiarism and other misconduct violations, if you commit a crime, you can also get in trouble at the campus level. And isn't that powerful to take away a degree of someone who is on a path towards higher perpetration rates and in higher settings where power will insulate them from abuse? And on the campus level, it's not just about justice. It's also about access to education, making sure there is a no contact order to keep that individual away so you can focus on your school, making sure you can switch your class, making sure you can switch the rooms. You're not sleeping where it happened every night. 
So there are multiple avenues for justice and we want multiple avenues because if the criminal system doesn't work, campus, civil, you keep kind of shuffling the deck just like we are with Title IX. Title IX's be not being enforced, well what about Cleary? Just have a few different tools in your toolkit. It's not just about one avenue. So while I agree that there could be more done at the criminal level, I don't think the criminal level's fixed yet and that's the next way that we need to target our attention. Thank you. Um, the, the mic in the back, Latrice. Hello. Um, I'm a graduate of Hobart and William Smith, and we were the school that made the New York Times to start with. I almost fainted. Anyway, <laughs> I knew this went on, but why didn't they pick on Harvard or Stanford? <laughs> anyway, my question is, my school still, I need transparency. How can I find out what how can you follow up on what is going on with, a, with cases that you know about and find out? And is there any way that um, I agree, I understand what, that, what the woman before me just said and what you said, and I thought that would be a good route, but obviously it's not. Mm -hmm. So I'd like you to um, tell all of us how, how can we have better transparency of specific issues that yeah. we know about? It, it's a very tough question for, for a variety of reasons. So one of the main reasons is in education, we do have a privacy law called FERPA, the Family Education Rights and Privacy Act, and that keeps educational records under seal. Little, little known fact, because schools don't want you to know, if someone is found responsible, there isn't as much protection because then they're a health and safety risk but they tend to generally always keep protection. So FERPA is there, and I think there's a benefit. There was a recent case in Kentucky with the Attorney General's office working with uh, newspapers to try to force information out about a repeat perpetrator professor. The survivors didn't want that. And so there is a tension about how do we keep transparency and accountability but respect the privacy. It's not easy. Um, so one of the things you can easily do is the Campus Accountability and Safety Act will require aggregate data. How many, how many cases are coming in? How many go through the process? How many get sanctions? What are those sanctions? So that legislation will start to shed a little more light and create, it'll circumvent FERPA so we can't keep hovering it over under blankets. Um, so that's one way to do it. And another way to do it is to actually start getting really critical about campus security and safety. Um, there was just a recent case, ESPN versus Notre Dame, where ESPN was trying to figure out how many athletes are being reported for committing crimes. They could not get it through a FOIA because at least in Indiana, because Notre Dame is a private school, even if they have state police, because it's a private school, they don't have to disclose it. So these institutions that we think are so beloved, we need to think critically. A lot of them are very intentional about what laws they want passed or not passed and what they get to do with those laws to keep hidden all these things. So we do need transparency, we do need accountability. That requires critical thinking and sometimes withholding our alumni donations or restricting it to the Title IX office to make our message clear that if you want our ongoing support, we need more accountability and transparency. Thank you. <laughs> I think that one was my clear in there. Here. My question is quick. You mentioned the hunting ground, and you said something about K there was one for K through 12. Yeah. What was that? Audrey and Daisy. It's also on Netflix, but it really follows high school survivors. So we focus so much on college, and there's so many tools at the college level. But really, this is happening in high schools. We actually know that there's very high rates of sexual violence at the high school level, which just continues to grow when we get into college. So it's a conversation still to be had, I think, at the national level. Thank you. And way in the back. What about the young man? What was his attitude? And uh, did he ever try to contact you? And what is he doing now? In the Senate or where? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I normally don't like questions about the people who did this to me, but I will make an exception because I think there is a valuable lesson here. Um, you know, there, there was retaliation against me um, very clearly when I did report. I was confronted um, at a fraternity party and he punched the wall next to both sides of my head to make it very clear what he thought. And I didn't back down because I knew that he himself, at least one of the two men, because there's two assailants, I knew he had been a victim of sexual abuse. 
And I knew this because I was good friends with his girlfriend. And she had told me that before any of this ever happened. So I kind of looked him square in the eye when he threatened me and said, I'm doing this for you as much as I'm doing it for me. Because I knew. And we have too much in our society of failing our youth, especially young men who are victimized. There's, you know, we talk about it like it's a women's issue. It's not. There are people of any lifestyle and background and gender identity that are experiencing this. And when we fail them and we don't embrace them and teach them and rehabilitate them and give them support, then we sometimes, unfortunately, recreate the next generation of perpetrators. So he was part of that. Um, the other young man, you know, may or may not be an Ivy League coach somewhere. So, um, you know, they, they do move on if we don't uh, kind of call them out. But I know I did what I could. Their names are in a police report if anyone wants to find out. If it ever happens again, they'll know that they're supported by my complaint. And that's actually one of the big things I tell survivors when they're picking and choosing. Do I report to the police? I may not win. Why is it worthwhile? It's always worthwhile. There is a record. And if anything ever happens, boy, there's support to take them down. Thank you. Uh, Mary Pollack from Michigan. Uh, what do you feel, this relates to uh, what several people have said, what do you feel about mandatory reporting? That is, anyone on a college or a high school education institution who is told, including students, who are told of a sexual assault must report that to the police mm -hmm. so that you have the dual systems going. You have the administrative system going and you have the criminal system going at the same time. Yeah. Uh, comment on mandatory reporting and uh, I know some victims do not want to report, mm -hmm. but comment on that if you would. Sure, absolutely. So right now federal law under the Violence Against Women Act makes clear that if a survivor comes to anyone on campus that is a responsible employee or campus safety authority, that they have to tell them they can report to the police, that if they want to report, it will be facilitated, there will be assistance provided to make it feasible, and last but not least, they can decline to report. Because sexual violence is when you lose all power control of your body, your autonomy, it takes so much from you, and it doesn't stop. I mean, back when I was an undergrad, um, we worked on a bill just to get the right for victims to get Plan B because even that choice was being taken away from them. So we want to be very careful when we're talking about choices. You know, we, are, we may be 18, but we're adults, and we have a life in front of us, and we know the price better than anyone else, what it takes when we speak out. We know who's going to not invite us to their parties, who's going to ostracize us from campus. I knew I could not stay on the crew team when I reported. I knew my career as an athlete was over. And that was really hard to swallow. I did not want to lose that. That was my identity. And I had to lose it in order to stand up for myself. So the price is large, but at the same time, of course, we know there's ongoing risk. I wish we could say that there wasn't. But what again, how I counsel survivors who are making this impossible decision um, is that there are repeat perpetrators. There's a lot of research that Dr. David Lisak did in 2002 about repeat perpetration and undetected rapists on campus specifically. And he found that it's a very small percentage of men, 6 to 12%, but they do it over and over and over and over. They average six victims each. In our criminal justice system that people sometimes think is effective, most convicted sex offenders have averaged 12 victims. So we are not effective as a community in identifying repeat perpetrators and making sure there's interventions if we can prevent their violence or rehabilitation if we can only give them limited consequences. So we're really failing on that end. Um, so when it comes to mandatory reporting, serve justice routinely goes against it. You really want the power to be a survivor. I think more survivors would report with the right support, with the right structure, and with the right encouragement. And we need to start reforming the system to make it be friendly enough to receive these reports, treat them with dignity and respect, and of course give protections for that brave act of stepping forward. Thank you. We're just about out of time. I, I believe there's a hand over here, and we'll, if we can get short answers, we'll be ready for these. Ronnie Embry, Indiana. Um, Indiana, as you've already mentioned, has some draconian laws. And are there states that do well? One of the things I discovered in the last year was that rape kits on a campus are only kept for a year as opposed to the police that can go up to 7 to 10 years. 
So especially because it deal often deal they often deal with athletes, mm. then because the system takes so long by the time you report, you go through, the rape kit's gone. Yeah. Uh, and so pro processing, it's been it's gone. So all yeah. evidence is gone of it, and that's a, so we're working on that at the state level to change the law. But are there any states that have much better laws? Um, it's a great question. I could go on for an entire lecture on rape kit access alone. We we focus on testing. That's not the issue. Access is actually the issue. In D.C. right now, there are six hospitals. Exactly one provides a rape kit. It's not the one that would help the president if he got shot tomorrow. We, we have no idea. Think about a rural community, right? Think about a campus in the middle of nowhere. Campuses themselves normally don't have resources to provide rape kits. They go into the community, and our states don't even require every ER to have one. So rape kit access is a problem. The storage is definitely an issue. If you, you all don't know Amanda Yen yet of RISE, she has done amazing efforts to give survivors the right to extend the holding of a rape kit to prevent its destruction. But many states allow destruction before the statute of limitations on the crime itself. So yet another issue. Um, so which states are doing it well? It's a tough question, yeah. <laughs> uh, I think every state has things that are good and things that are not so good, and it's an ongoing battle. But really, my hope, if, we, if Hillary had won, what I would have gone and done at the Senate level um, at Congress would be to ask that rape kits stop being criminal forensic examinations and to be part of a patient's medical rights. That way, we control what happens to our information because even if there's not a criminal conviction, trust me, the rape kit evidence is helpful for civil and campus level justice. It's not just about the police. And in some jurisdictions, police can deny someone access to a rape kit and say, well, we, we don't think there's a crime, so don't bother taking it. So there's so many issues wrong with rape kits. I think it's an area we can focus on, make sure access is there, control is given to survivors so that justice is in their hands and, and not the state who picks and chooses whether it cares about survivors. Okay, let's Take these last two very quickly. <laughs> Would you provide a brief comment on DeVos's desire for vouchers and K-12 sexual assault issues? Um, it's a very timely question. Uh, we've been asking to meet with the Department of Education for a while under this new administration, and I believe that will be happening in two or three weeks. Um, you know, the vouchers, I, I'm probably not going to step into that direction because it's more of an education focus and then more specific to sexual assault, but K through 12 sexual violence, I mean, under this administration, we know that sexual violence, period, is not important, regardless of where it's happening, but how much more so at the education level. And with K through 12, I think there is a real need to ensure that there are Title IX coordinators, which is something basic. Every college has one person designated as a Title IX coordinator. There's even Title IX offices. Take that to the K through 12, You'll have one Title IX coordinator for all of Brooklyn, every school district, every single student, hundreds of thousands. There's no way that that can be well done. So in looking at K through 12, that's obviously state-focused push and demand that we need to be leveraging, but we need to have the basics in place at the K through 12 level. Will they even have a policy on this issue? Will the policy say police handle it and nothing else? Um, so K through 12, compliance with Title IX is way behind the times compared to colleges. And I wish we had the administration to make that progress. But without the administration, we have the power of the people. And that's going to be the answer. Thank you, Laura. Thanks so much. And let's give her another round of applause. continue to make tremendous contributions to empowering women and girls and carry on the outstanding tradition and advocacy of the Eleanor Roosevelt Fund. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>